If you want to be a successful wrestler, all you have to do is find a great gimmick and then you're a made man, right? Well, while in most cases this is true, there are times when even that hasn't been enough to keep a performer on top forever, as for one reason or another, the creative team decided to engage in some character assassination. But what are the most egregious examples of once great gimmicks being ruined? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be looking at today. And where better to start than with the absolute butchering of a killer gimmick that was Vader in WWF? Yes, if you were a fan of WCW during the early 90s, then you were all too aware of Big Van Vader, as he was just about the most terrifying heel monster out there. It didn't matter if he was pummeling fan favorites like Sting, making short work of legends like Ric Flair, or damn near paralyzing people such as Cactus Jack, he always looked dominating. Even out east in Japan, he'd done the seemingly impossible when he squashed Antonio Inoki in a matter of minutes. So you'd think that once he joined WWF in 1996, it would be a slam dunk that he'd be on top of the world there, too. But that's where you'd be wrong, because despite starting out strong in the Fed when he took out Gorilla Monsoon, then became the number one contender to Shawn Michaels' WWF title, soon after this, the downfall of Leon White began. Why did he start slipping down the card at this point? Well, it appears that after HBK took a disliking to the Mastodon and decided he didn't want to drop the belt to him as planned, Vader became the newest victim of the clique's backstage politicking. So because he didn't have the right friends and the right places then, the former three-time WCW World Champion and three-time IWGP World Champion sunk so deeply into near irrelevance that by the time he was about to leave the company in early 1998, he was jobbing to the likes of Mark Henry and Bradshaw. It is really staggering if you go back and think about just how badly WWF botched this one. Hell, it wasn't as if Vader didn't still have plenty of juice left in him, because once he was finished up in the Fed, he went right back over to Japan where he would become a two-time Triple Crown Champion for All Japan Pro Wrestling. That said, you could argue his character assassination in Vince McMahon's promotion wasn't as bad as what the next person we're going to be discussing today had to endure when they joined WWF in 2001 as it was at this point that Diamond Dallas Page went from being People's Champion to Stalker of the Undertaker's wife in one fell swoop. Now we all know how badly botched the invasion angle was. After all, it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to pit the two biggest wrestling companies in North America against one another and see who came out the victor. But with Vince McMahon being unwilling to shell out the big bucks in order to bring in guys like Ric Flair, Goldberg, or the NWO, it meant most of the WCW roster that went over to the WWF in 2001 were the mid-card B team. Still, there were at least two big names in there who could have made a difference to things, and their names were Booker T and Diamond Dallas Page. But while Booker T was treated like somewhat of a star right out of the gate, the same could not be said for his New Jersey-born friend as rather than have the three-time WCW World Champion come in and be treated like a major player right off the bat, DDP was instead booked to be nothing more than a creepy guy straight off the boards of 4chan who was stalking Sarah, the Undertaker's wife. And what made this even worse was not just that it wasn't in any way keeping with Paige's character, it also made no sense as he already had a well-known wife in Kimberly Page. On top of this, his apparent reasoning for stalking Sarah being that he wanted The Undertaker to make him famous made no sense as he was already famous. Need we remind you, he was a former three-time WCW World Champion. But that didn't matter to Vince McMahon, so DDP got buried in a manner so devastating it's rarely been seen again since. And because of that, a chance to add some life to the invasion was lost. Would Paige eventually recover and get to reach the top of the card in WWE? No, he'd only ever get as high as the European title picture, and given how much of a legend he is, that's a complete crime. Of course, it's not as big of a crime as one of the major booking mistakes WCW made during their latter days though, because it was in December of 1997 they got their hands on the hottest act in the industry and then proceeded to do absolutely nothing of value with him. That's right it's time to talk about Bret Hart. Yes, arguably the greatest in-ring performer of all time, as over the course of his career he put on some of the greatest bouts ever seen inside of the squared circle. And it wasn't just that he was a great worker. No, the hitman was also massively over with fans, so much so that in 1997 he was probably still the biggest star in WWF. Of course, his time there would come to a dramatic end at that November Survivor Series, as this was when the Montreal Screwjob occurred. Still, WWF's loss at this point was WCW's gain, right? 
After all, they not only had one of the most over and best wrestlers on the planet on their roster now, but they had the chance to capitalize on one of the most talked about moments in the industry's history. Unfortunately though, they weren't able to do this, as instead of bringing in Hart as a conquering Canadian hero looking to get redemption for how badly he was treated by Vince McMahon, Eric Bischoff instead booked him to sort of help Sting beat Hollywood Hogan, then kind of just do nothing for the next year. Yeah, it was a truly puzzling choice as it cooled off Brett in record time and meant that everyone just tuned to Raw instead to see Steve Austin act as the surrogate for the hitman there. Why did it happen this way? Well, if you believe Eazy E, the former five-time WWF champion had lost any passion he had for wrestling by this point. But even if that's true, WCW could have at least tried to do something with him outside of finally giving him a token run with the world title over a year after he debuted. Sadly though, it didn't play out this way and, to make matters worse, come early 2000, Hart's career would be over when he suffered a series of concussions over a short period of time and ended up being forced to retire. But at least Brett can take solace in the fact that he wasn't the only person who WCW signed from another company and then proceeded to completely botch, because a few months after his debut, then ECW World Champion Mike Awesome also came into the Southern Wrestling Company and was subsequently booked to be the Fat Chick Thrilla. WCW in 2000, what are you gonna do? Obviously, this one is going to be bad. That's right, when Vince Russo is in charge, you can be assured things are going to get very stupid very fast. And that's exactly what happened when the man who was still technically holding the Extreme Championship Wrestling top prize signed on the dotted line with Ted Turner in April of that year. Sure, this one was never exactly going to be as big of a deal as Real World's Champion Ric Flair joining WWF in 1991, but surely there was a better way to go with the angle than to just have Awesome become an instant mid-carder for a couple of months and then take on one of the worst gimmicks in memory. Hell, if his matches against Masato Tanaka had shown us anything, it was that the Tampa native could be an absolute killer in the ring. Sadly though, he would never got a chance to show this in Atlanta, as instead he'd morph into the fat chick Thrilla, a guy whose entire gimmick was that he was into fat girls. Yeah, that's it. It doesn't get any deeper than that. Just as his subsequent gimmick of that 70s guy didn't get any deeper than guy who wears tie-dye and owns a lava lamp. Honestly, it's almost as if Austin was being punished for being a friend of Hulk Hogan after he made his infamous speech at Bash of the Beach 2000. And as it happens, this might have been the case, at least if Mike himself was to be believed. Whatever the reason he was metaphorically taken out back and shot dead, it doesn't excuse what took place with him in WCW. But then at least he wasn't Bray Wyatt in 2020, because what took place when The Fiend went up against Goldberg that February made anything that Mike Awesome had to undergo look tame by comparison. Really, we could make a whole list out of times WWE botched a character created by Wyndham Rotunda, as it seemed to be a recurring theme throughout his time there. He came up with an idea which got massively over with fans and had a huge amount of potential, then Vince McMahon snuffed all that potential out with some trademark terrible booking. But while the fall of the Bayou cult leader was bad enough, probably the saddest example of Bray getting butchered came when, right as arguably his finest creation, The Fiend, was starting to find its long-term footing following the fiasco that was Hell in a Cell 2019, he was jobbed out to Bill Goldberg in under four minutes. That's right, truly, this is one of the worst treatments of a character in the modern day, as it pretty much killed any hope The Fiend had left of being a top-level player. Yes, he would attempt to recover with his excellent Firefly Funhouse match against John Cena one month later at WrestleMania, but really, Bray shouldn't have had to do this. No, he should have been in the main event defending his Universal title instead. Unfortunately though, Vince McMahon decided that 53-year-old Goldberg needed the rub instead, as he was the plucky young upstart with a bright future ahead of him. All we can say is thank god Triple H has the book now because while he's far from perfect in the role, his creative versus latter day Vince McMahon's is night and day in terms of quality. That's right, it's hard to imagine the game botching The Fiend so badly, just as it's hard to imagine him doing the same with our next subject if he were in charge of writing the show back in 2000 when Rikishi infamously did it for The Rock. Now WWF in 2000 was brilliant. Hell, you could argue that it's the best year the company ever had creatively, right up there with 1997 and 1998. But even they weren't immune to some terrible ideas at this time, such as when they took one of the fastest rising babyfaces on the roster and absolutely nuked his character by having him turn heel when precisely no one was asking for it. 
It didn't even make sense that Rikishi would have been the one to try and end Steve Austin's career the year prior by running him over, as he wasn't on the roster at the time. But even if he had been, it would have still been stupid, as what had gotten the San Francisco native over wasn't that he was a cold, calculating villain who tried to outright murder his enemies. No, it was that he was a fun-loving babyface who wanted nothing more than to dance. Obviously, though, once he admitted he'd tried to take out the rattlesnake so his cousin The Rock could reach the top of the card unhindered, it removed any of the babyface elements of his gimmick in one fell swoop. And it meant there was now no longer anything interesting about the big man, as he was suddenly a bland villain. So badly did this go for him, in fact, he wouldn't even make it onto the card of WrestleMania 17 a few months later. And given how fast he'd been rising prior to this, that's actually quite impressive. What's not impressive, though, is that even when he turned face again in late 2001, the damage had already been done, and so Rikishi was never able to get back to the level of main eventer again. And because of that, the rest of his time in WWE would be pretty forgettable, and would come nowhere close to what he was able to achieve when he was a part of Too Cool. But it's not always the case that being the dancing big man is the best thing for your career. In fact, in most cases, it's actually a bad thing. And perhaps nowhere has this been more evident than in the case of our next subject, the Great Kali. That's right, upon first glance at the 7 foot plus giant, Kali looked to have potential for a great career in WWE. Unfortunately though, this isn't how things panned out for the big man, as it was towards the end of the 2000s, after he'd undergone a lengthy undefeated streak, then won the World Heavyweight title, that the Great Kali would suffer the fate of all giants once they'd been beaten, he'd turn into a comedy character. And for him, this meant the dreaded dancing gimmick, something so stupid it instantly killed any hopes he ever had of returning to the main event scene again. Yes, while only a few years before, the Indian native had been taking on the likes of both John Cena and Rey Mysterio and winning these bouts, now he was either jobbing to the likes of Dolph Ziggler or getting eliminated from the Royal Rumble by Mason Ryan, of all people. Then, when he was done with that, it was all bad comedy segments, such as him taking part in the kiss cam or him busting a move in the middle of the ring for fans everywhere to groan at. Sure, he was clearly past the point of being a top-level guy at this point, but surely there was something better that could have been done with him than this. Maybe he could have been an Andre the Giant-like special attraction who only appeared every so often? Maybe he could have been the heavy for another performer like Jinder Mahal. There were plenty of possibilities, but in the end, WWE chose to go with the worst option, and it absolutely destroyed all of Kali's remaining credibility in the process. That said, this still wasn't as bad as what became of another giant a few years later in 2013, as this was the point the final nail was driven into the coffin of Glenn Jacobs when he became Corporate Kane. Now, trying to refresh the Kane character here wasn't necessarily a terrible idea, as it had been around for so long come the mid-2010s that something was certainly needed to make it interesting again. After all, he'd put on the mask and removed it again so many times by then, it felt like he was little more than a legacy act. So in attempting to do something which hadn't been done yet, WWE booked him to put on a suit and tie and become Corporate Kane, the director of operations for the Authority. But while this wasn't a terrible character in a vacuum, it was terrible in what it represented for the Big Red Machine. What exactly did it represent? Well, that Kane was well and truly dead, as there was literally nothing to this one which was in any way in line with the character as it had originally been presented in 1997. Seriously, at this point, you might as well have just given Glenn Jacobs a different name as he was playing someone entirely unconnected to his most popular creation. Hell, Kane was a movie monster in the vein of Michael Myers, and this, well, this was just a middle management suit, and yes, you could argue it was a fun inversion of things, but it wasn't Kane. So for that alone, it has to be considered a great example of a character being absolutely ruined. So badly did it ruin him, in fact, that pretty soon afterwards, Jacobs would start to leave the wrestling world behind. And we know part of the reason for this was also because he was entering into a career in politics, but come on, was anyone really interested in the Big Red Machine anymore after we saw him basically play the role of Bob from Finance? No, after this one, there was just nowhere left for Kane to go anymore, so it's just as well he's largely retired at this point. After all, none of us want to remember The Undertaker's kayfabe brother like that. Rather, we'd prefer to remember him for the monster heel he was during his early days before all the rough edges of him were sanded down. And as it happens, the same thing could be said of our next subject too, 
As while the majority of his run was actually as a babyface, it was only when Doink the Clown was a heel that he was worth watching. Yes, back before he was a comedy babyface who wanted nothing more than to make the heels of the day look foolish with his wacky antics, Doink was one of the best and most underrated heel acts of his generation. Seriously, who isn't scared of a maniacal clown? It's the exact reason Pennywise from Stephen King's It has become such a pop culture touchstone over the years. And with the role of Doink initially being played by Matt Osborne, someone who is regularly described by his peers as being a real-life Krusty the Clown, it's no surprise this one was firing on all cylinders when it debuted on WWF TV in 1992. As for something which came from a time period that was so cartoonish and lame, Osborne's creation actually felt legitimately creepy. We ourselves remember feeling the chills when, back at WrestleMania 9 in April of 1993, a second doink came out from under the ring to help his doppelganger defeat Crush. And we remember feeling like jumping behind the sofa every time that horrifying circus music hit to signal he was coming down to have another match. Sadly though, any sense of the clown being something to fear was killed stone dead when he turned babyface. And it wasn't just his intimidation factor which was gone at this point. No, it was also his overall aura as being someone to watch. Why was that? Well, this was the period when Matt Osborne was fired from WWF, and so the job of playing Doink instead moved on to a bunch of other performers, such as Steve Kern and Steve Lombardi. And with neither of these men having either the charisma of the original or the understanding of what made the gimmick work, it meant things quickly started to fall flat. So flat did it fall, in fact, that by 1995, Doink was an afterthought, someone who was firmly relegated to the role of mid-card jobber. And that's quite a fall considering how great the initial character had been when it was first introduced a couple of years earlier. Still, even this isn't the worst example of character assassination in wrestling history, because we've got another for you which is arguably even more egregious. And that's the time Perry Saturn fell in love with a mop named Moppy. You heard us right. In 2001, right as the Attitude Era was ending, noted tough guy Perry Saturn was booked to be a guy who fell in love with an inanimate cleaning product. Why had this happened? Well, it was basically a way of punishing the Cleveland native after he'd shot on a jobber named Mike Bell during an episode of Jacked and damn near crippled him in the process. Obviously then, such actions couldn't be allowed and so in order to make amends, the former seven-time tag team champion was given the unenviable task of becoming a comedy goofball. One who'd apparently taken too many shots to the head and was now infatuated with a mop. Yeah. If there was ever a career killer of a gimmick change, then this was it, as over the space of the next few months, Saturn went from someone who'd been a member of the Radicals to someone who was never going to be taken seriously as a performer ever again. Even when Moppy was destroyed in a wood chipper Fargo style by Raven later that year, in fact, there was no coming back for Perry, as by this point he was always going to be seen as nothing more than a joke. So perhaps realizing this, he made his exit from WWE soon thereafter, and from there, a few brief appearances in TNA and Japan aside, he effectively retired from in-ring competition. Could things have been different had he not made the mistake of getting a little too real on that fateful day and, as a result, gotten forced to endure the consequences of his actions? Sure. After all, he was never going to be a main eventer in WWF or anything, but he still had a lot of potential as a high-level mid-card act. Sadly though, the lasting impression people have of Perry Saturn today isn't his time in ECW or WCW where he was a badass, and it isn't his awesome finisher, the Rings of Saturn. No, instead, it's the period he'd spend playing a man with brain damage who is in love with a freaking mop. But then, that just goes to show how devastating a bad gimmick change can be, and how wary wrestlers have to be when it comes to what their next steps are, because if they're not careful, they could end up like everyone we've discussed today.